Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for another It's Learning webinar, this time for a panel discussion on the recently passed ESSA legislation and UDL or Universal Design for Learning. My name is Jill Davis and I am the Marketing Coordinator for It's Learning. I want to extend a warm welcome and thank you to both of our panelists today and provide a brief introduction. Mike Jamerson has served as the Director of Technology for Bartholomew Consolidated School District in Indiana for over 17 years. Bartholomew is in their first year of implementing its learning with more than 80% of their students and teachers now using its learning in any given week. Working closely with the district's instructional team, Mike has implemented a one-to-one -one program. BCSC is well known nationally for their work in universal design for learning and its learning plays an important role in supporting BCSC's efforts in that area. Mike also serves as a chair for COSIN, the Consortium of School Networking. Pete Just, also a COSIN board member, serves as the Chief Technology Officer of Metropolitan School District of Wayne Township in Indiana. Pete was the architect of his district's Blueprint for Digital Learning, and he has led the township's technology application of UDL by creating digital learning spaces of all thousand district classrooms. With the support of his team, the MSD of Wayne Township has successfully created environments to allow students multiple pathways to graduation and enabling long-term successes. Nationally, he mentors other CTOs and contributes to various industry advisory committees. I would now like to give everyone a quick look at the agenda. We have planned this webinar to provide an open forum for questions and discussions around ESSA and UDL. I encourage you to enter any questions or comments throughout the broadcast, either in the question pane in the GoToWebinar control panel or on Twitter using the hashtag ESSAUDL. We will address as many as possible during the Q&A. We will start with two quick audience polls. The first is related to ESSA legislation, and the second is related to UDL. Following the polls, we will begin the panel discussion. Mike and Pete will share their thoughts, strategies, and experiences on today's topic, and then we will move on to the Q&A. A note, too, that we will be sending out a link of this recorded webinar following the presentation. So let's start by sharing some impressions and predictions about how the recently passed ESSA legislation will impact teaching and learning. The first poll question is, I feel that the ESSA legislation will have measurable effects on, and then you may select one or more of the following options, standardized testing, support for UDL and personalized learning, teacher evaluations, flexibility given to states and districts, and school accountability systems. I will give everyone a few minutes to review the question and respond. Okay, thank you for your participation. We will now take a look at everyone's responses. Okay, um, Mike and Pete, would you like to take a minute to respond to these poll results? Well, I think this is Pete. I think that um, everyone's right. <laughs> you know, I think that in the end, um, ESSA will allow us to have an impact on all of these things. And, um, you know, honestly, uh, you know, it's as a replacement for No Child Left Behind. Um, you know, it has really uh, given us a great opportunity right now because we're in this rulemaking stage at this phase of the process in DC and they um, are looking for input on how 
uh, these things can be impacted. Obviously, we're still under the, uh, the same, um, we're, we're focused on the same things that we were focused on before with NCLB, the four pillars, they call them. But uh, each of these things uh, certainly can be impacted. Mike? I think each one of those is going to be uh, pretty significantly impacted. Um, I think I would probably agree that uh, UDL is a little bit lower. Um, I'm not sure. I think future evaluations will have some impact, although a lot of that will be at a state level, I think. Right. And I think from the standpoint of universal design, one of the big differences, um, and one of the things that still needs to happen, is a change in perception from whether universal design is something that really uh, uh, touches every student or whether it's something still relegated uh, or placed back in the special services, special ed area. Okay, um, thank you very much um, for responding. Um, Mike, if you could move a little closer to the mic, um, that would be great. Um, we are now going to move on to our um, second poll question for our audience. And this question is asking to what extent is UDL a part of teaching and learning in your district? And the options are not yet, limited, moderate, and committed district-wide focus. So again, I'll give everyone a few minutes to review the question and respond. I feel like we need some music here. Okay, let's, let's take a look at the results to this question. Okay, thank you again for your participation in this poll. Uh, we have our responses here on the screen. Uh, Mike and Pete, would you take a minute to respond to these results? Uh, yes, yeah, at, this is Mike. At BCSC, we really believe that UDL can have a, a significant impact on learning and that that's really been borne out by our decade-long experience with universal design as our instructional framework for all of our students. Uh, we've seen positive and continual growth in every one of the subgroups and every one of the ethnicities uh, over the past six years, and we attribute that in large part to universal design. Yeah, this is Pete. I, I think that, um, you know, if you look back to the foundations of universal design um, before the L was added, and it was more of an architectural concept of trying to use ramps instead of steps and, and things of that nature, um, you know, the goal is for it to be, um, you know, fully integrated, ubiquitous, really. And I think we're all working towards that to some degree, but there are a lot of um, there are a lot of barriers uh, that we face in terms of just our, our normal procedures, our normal purchasing decisions, our, our, our typical everything. And uh, so it really does take a very big focus uh, of the entire cabinet and the school district uh, sort of setting it as, a, uh, as an objective to be met. So I'm not surprised to see these results. Um, I'd say we're, we're probably in the moderate camp or um, Mike's uh, school district's probably more in the committed camp. Um, and, I, and I think that's pretty typical uh, for what we might expect. One other, one other uh, point uh, that I'd like to make here is that when we look at universal design, and one of the things that come to mind is that all disabilities are really contextual. Uh, and that struck home for me when I was in Norway back in December. I realized that I was the uh, language learner uh, as opposed to being here where obviously English is, is my native language. So disabilities are contextual and when we look at how we deal with those, that's one of the things that has a significant impact on how we teach 
and how we work with students. Okay, great. Thank you both for sharing your thoughts and thank you to our audience members for participating in both of those polls. Now let's start with our first um, question for Mike and Pete. Our first um, poll question was related to the new ESSA legislation. And one aspect that is of particular interest is its clear support of UDL and personalized learning. Would each of you respond to ESSA's support of UDL? Uh, what do you think it means for your districts? And what impact do you think it could have on teaching and learning in districts across the country? Well, I'll go ahead and start. I think that it's important. You have a quote up there from CAST um, that um, helps us understand that the appropriations that ESSA will eventually provide are really coming out of these UDL definitions. So I think, first of all, it's important to understand the uh, the essential nature of advocacy. Um, these things that we're seeing now are really based on work that was done, you know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, and now is starting to come to fruition. So, just sort of an encouragement to everyone. And although that um, we don't really know what the appropriations are going to be yet, we do know um, that um, they will come out of state plans. So, uh, what we'll see. Uh, affect us uh, in terms of the impact upon teaching and learning and a UDL specifically is really going to be determined by what our states do. Um, and so it's a great time right now to talk to your Department of Ed at the state level, uh, to talk to legislators and, and try to make a case for why we think this is important. So I think that the level of impact will be directly proportional to uh, what folks hear back from us that are decision makers. Um, you know, what they hear from us as practitioners. So I think that um, we can have a pretty deep impact, um, but it will only be as deep as uh, we can define. It's really kind of a, somebody uh, explained uh, ESSA as really kind of an early Christmas present uh, last uh, December, and I thought that was a good definition, but to some degree the Christmas present is still kind of being un unwrapped. And this next year, uh, where we're kind of in this, um, in, in this period of rulemaking is really important and if we want to see a big impact uh, on the classroom uh, in our schools that are right down the road, uh, we really need to start making the case for what is it that we would like to see impacted. And Mike, I don't know if you would care to speak to that a little bit more. I think, I think, uh, I think that's really uh, very true and while in, in many ways there aren't a lot of places in universe or in ESSA where universal design is referenced, there are many places as you read through, you see areas that universal design can be applied to uh, in terms of engagement, uh, in terms of um, accessibility, in terms of how it relates to students. And as Pete said, working with our legislature to and, and, and being there to present uh, the advocacy uh, for this is going to be important because it is very early in the process uh, and even though it, there are some specifics laid out uh, until we see funding we really don't know what those are. And, and it's specifically the places that it's called out, um, it uses this quote a lot, it says I'm using the principles of universal design for learning. I mean that's that's part of ESSA is, is it's kind of referencing that, but it doesn't really say what that means. Um, there's a there's a part um, in the state use of funds that talks about using technology consistent with the principles of universal design uh, to support the learning needs of all students, including students with uh, uh, disabilities or English learners. So there is a, that's about as specific as it gets um, inside of uh, the actual uh, ESSA. Um, verbiage. Okay, um, thank you both for responding to that question. Um, we'll now move on to the second question. This one is related to ESSA's impact on EdTech. When we view the image on the right from the perspective of technology's role in supporting UDL, there are some interesting things to consider. Um, for each of you, what do you think are the biggest ways ESSA will impact EdTech in the years to come? Well, 
I, I think it's going to have a couple of different impacts. I mean, I can see places in each one of these uh, topics and, and key development areas where it's going to have some significant uh, impact. Um, I think it's important to remember that UDL involves uh, removing barriers and looking for ways uh, to reach all students. And so it focuses really on smoothing the path for everyone rather than just building unique ad hoc paths. And that really goes to what that kind of uh, new model is from the professional development standpoint. Uh, the fact it's really good to see uh, that there is some commitment finally again to support um, uh, ed tech in terms of uh, national funding. Uh, that's uh, been not necessarily uh, accessible in past years. Uh, and directed funding, the ability to use uh, funds in some different ways uh, is going to be important because this transition to be able to support uh, the multiple means of engagement, of representation, and of action and expression are not without uh, a, a technical expense. Well, and, and you know, I think as I look at this chart, I think uh, the, the, the yellowish-orange part uh, is probably going to be uh, maybe one of the more impacted uh, because uh, that specific area about professional development, um, there is uh, a lot of, co of talk in, in the document of uh, professional development and uh, kind of a well-rounded uh, professional development, to trying to increase technology use, to increase achievement, growth, and digital literacy. And uh, the funding uh, that is going to be provided, obviously, is going to come out of the Title I funding formulas that we have in place now. Um, and the great thing is that 95%, although this is money allocated to states, 95% of it flows to districts. So, um, and, and they have specific details in there as well um, that, you know, the 25, I'm sorry, 20% of it has to be used uh, for um, the, uh, the, the, the process of, uh, of trying to create a well-rounded educational opportunity. Well, obviously, there's a lot of opportunity there for UDL. Um, and then, um, you know, there is a bit of money uh, allocated for technology, uh, but that's only going to be about 15%. They're still defining what that exactly means, but there's a 15% fund on caps, a uh, funding cap on funds for technology infrastructure, they call it, and they specifically mention things like Chromebooks. So you're not going to get your Chromebooks out of this necessarily, but you're going to get a lot of professional development. You're going to get a lot of uh, dollars to go towards uh, what they're calling uh, improving, um, you know, student um, opportunities, well-rounded educational opportunities. I think there's one other place, and that's in the area of increased uh, research and development. And I, but yeah. as, I, as I think about that, one of the pieces I think is important that is that uh, attention is going to be paid to both ends of the spectrum, because our large districts have one sort of scaling problems. Uh, challenge, and our small districts have really a different kind of challenge as to how they will deal with technology with limited staff uh, that, that, that they have. Okay, um, great. Thank you so much for your thoughts on that question. Um, we will move on now to the third question. And for this one, we're going to reference a recent EdWeek article on ESSA that highlighted ESSA's broadened definition of school success and expected changes to school accountability. So Mike and Pete, a few questions here. First, what are your thoughts on expected changes to school accountability under ESSA? And also, how does a UDL focus support important non-academic factors like student engagement? Well, I think, first of all, it does speak to the importance of growth um, as well as engagement. Uh, Pete mentioned that just a moment ago. But universal design for learning is really all about student engagement. It starts with that. Um, and at BCFC, we talk about universal design for learning and the, the expert learner. So we've looked at our school-wide learning outcomes with an eye to how do they relate to expert learners. Um, 
and by develop and also uh, by developing staff to understand and apply the universal des uh, design to practice, we create students that are resourceful and knowledgeable and strategic and goal directed, purposeful and motivated, and those are all directly related back to student engagement. I think that um, you know the uh, the the target of um, requiring states to measure something that's non-academic is really uh, a pretty big deal. Um, you know, we've tip we typically measured those reading, language arts, math, and and a bit of science, um, and this is uh, this has been it's a good idea, but the 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 devil's in the details, <laughs> and we don't know the details yet. And I think that's that's part of uh, why I'd encourage a kind of a call to action to your state uh, folks, because there is going to be a lot of local decision making that's going to happen in terms of what exactly this means. Um, you know, I'm not really sure what student engagement means. I, I've tried to figure this out for a couple of years. Um, I, I really think that we have to be a little bit of we have to be a bit careful about what that might mean. Uh, certainly, we don't want it to mean that they're just doing something. <laughs> we want it to go towards, uh, and I think it, it, the goal will be to go towards, you know, helping to um, increase achievement, growth, uh, digital literacy, the things that are really spelled out here, um, more than just something as general as, as student uh, engagement. Um, so my hope is that um, the changes to school accountability will have something um, that is going to be a really great measure of what, I guess I'd say, what students are doing besides academically improving. Um, for example, are you doing things that are creating better projects? Are there capstone projects? Are there uh, things that are that they're turning in because of, uh, you know, some type of uh, um, a project-based learning approach, and do those project-based learning approaches um, include all students and, and give all students an opportunity to succeed, or do they cater particularly to those students that are already high-performing? I think those types of questions uh, remain to be answered, and uh, my hope is that um, what we'll end up with is something that measures um, a very important factor as opposed to something as general uh, and, and really unmeasurable, I think, is, is student engagement. Okay, think, great. Just just to uh, touch on that, I also I, th I think that uh, from the standpoint of what it really means uh, to have a successful student, needs to be looking at those areas of uh, uh, collaboration, uh, critical thinking, uh, and, and as we said, how do projects, how do the various pieces and parts that students do fit into that picture, which perhaps is a pretty broad umbrella of student engagement, uh, but when you can hit those, uh, then you really do get students that are engaged in their, their learning and that are working for, uh, towards becoming uh, expert learners. Well, and, and you know, maybe rather than student engagement, there, there, there's a number of places where it says will be accessible, you know, learning will be accessible to all students, and then it would maybe say such as incorporating the principles of universal design. So maybe a better thing to, to look for and to try to measure if it's not going to be academic is what is the access like? Because we can measure access. There's a number of ways that that could be measured um, that might be really helpful in determining whether we're Putting, setting the table, as it were, for every student to be successful, no matter how they come to the table. Okay, thank you both again. Um, our next question is centered on UDL, or Universal Design for Learning, and it's a term that's heard frequently among those in education, but many people do not have a clear understanding of what UDL is. Since yours are two of the districts leading the way with UDL, I think it would be very helpful for our audience if we dedicated a few minutes to discussing what UDL is. Would each of you discuss that and also give us a snapshot as to what UDL looks like in your districts? Well, universal design is uh, really founded on three different uh, large principles which include the multiple means of engagement, in other words, how do you get students, uh, how do you catch their attention, how do you get them engaged in what your, the instruction is, 
multiple means of representation, which is how do you focus, how do you present the material, how do you make it, as we said earlier, accessible to students, uh, and then third, multiple means of action and expression. And I think if you were to look uh, in one of our classrooms, the way that you would see these things played out, uh, for example, uh, our, much of our instruction starts with the question of why. Uh, and, and, the, and the why question is not why why does this happen, but it's really why do we need to learn this? Why is this why is this piece important? But as you then look at uh, what the students and the instructor are doing, for example, in a representation, you might see that uh, a student using uh, its learning might see both uh, a visual uh, video production of the material. They might have an audio replay of a lecture, or they might have um, a section of the text to read. All three of those could be made available so that a student needing to access that material could access it in a way that works best for that student. On the other end of uh, action and expression, you really get to how do those students present that material and demonstrate their mastery, and they do that, again, through multiple means, whether it's uh, a video production, uh, an audio production, um, a text chat. Uh, each of those uh, becomes a piece of that. And I think the other piece that you would, if, when we talk about how does universal design change or how does it look in the, in the district, um, it changes things like that, such as our evaluation system for our teachers. 50% of it is based uh, on universal design implementation. And that includes district administrators, it includes coaches and counselors and deans. Um, so all of those pieces really come together to weave into the fabric of what we do on, on a daily basis in, in our classrooms uh, as we move our kids towards becoming those expert learners that I mentioned earlier. You know, and that's uh, those are great examples, Mike. Um, for us, um, we kind of go back about to the year 2000 or so. We decided to renovate all of our schools. They were all rather old, um, and it really started with architectural decisions um, in terms of how to design our classrooms, how to design our schools, and uh, we asked ourselves the question: uh, What could we do to eliminate barriers? Um, and it was purely an architectural question at first, um, which is again kind of the roots of universal design um, in uh, architecture. And um, then we followed up that question um, as we were talking to our special services uh, folks and uh, talking to teachers and principals, other administrators, and uh, and asked, well, what can we do in the classrooms themselves? And so um, we did we did a number of things. Um, I wish I could kind of take you on a tour here, but uh, we did a number of things in the classrooms that kind of helped um, eliminate uh, some of the problems, both from an architectural perspective and also from a learning perspective. Uh, from a learning perspective, uh, we created the classrooms um, so that um, teachers uh, didn't have to uh, speak loudly. Um, we, we tried to incorporate um, as many uh, sound field systems into the uh, classrooms as we could where the teachers could wear their mics and just speak normally and we don't have a sound system in the room per se um, but we do have a way to distribute sound through the room of that key um, participant, the teacher, um, and then we um, also have it set up so that you can also pass around a mic in, in those situations. That's a small help. Uh, we don't have that yet in all of our schools, but um, but that's one of our goals. The, uh, the other thing that um, we've tried to do is uh, visually allow for easy representation so um, all of the all the classrooms have uh, projection systems in them and that's been true for gosh I think I've replaced almost all those projectors now so that's been probably true for eight or nine years that all the classrooms have that and that's really helpful um, because uh, oftentimes we would have really small displays and it was hard for, for everyone to see um, and those uh, 
have been increasing in their interactivity and, and those sort of things. And then, of course, uh, software has been a big part for us as well, uh, trying to provide the same supports that we might provide to certain students, and we're only providing to them, much like with the sound field systems, we only had certain supports for certain students, and you had to be identified and go through a process, uh, almost a vetting process as to whether you could get to this tool or not. Um, we're trying to eliminate those barriers um, by providing all students with the same types of software that um, our uh, students might get that have been specifically identified. Uh, so that's sort of what it looks like in, in our school district. Okay, thank you both um, again for your thoughtful responses. Um, we have one more question um, for Mike and Pete before we begin responding to questions from our audience. Um, and by the way, we do have many questions rolling in, so feel free if you haven't yet, um, submit them now and we will get to them during the Q&A. Um, this last question um, is related to the careful technology planning and selection process that is critical to supporting UDL. Would each of you talk about your experiences as you moved through that process and offer advice to our audience members who might be looking to implement UDL in their districts? I think uh, I'll start because I kind of was just finishing on this point. I think the question you're always asking is, um, can this help? Um, when you well okay when you come across certain technologies are transformative um, and those transformative technologies sort of change the game somehow they they provide additional um, viewability uh, additional ability to understand something um, and when we see these technologies I, I guess that the, we kind of get excited by the whiz uh, bang excitement of it um, and we should always be asking ourselves uh, what, it, what is it that this provides and adds to learning? And then, will this provide it to all learners? And if it won't, what can we do to make that happen? In other words, identifying what the barriers are and trying to take them down before the initial implementation. Um, a lot of times after the initial implementation, it's kind of hard to go back and retroactively do that. So, And then if you find something that's really great for a certain, you might think, subset of your school district, your, your, your students, um, you, you, we always ask ourselves, will this help other students other than those that have been identified uh, for it to help? And if it can, uh, would we maybe want to consider uh, a, a larger purchase, um, somehow spreading the wealth to those students that might not have been identified but might benefit from it? Those are some general uh, principles that we try to follow. And I think with respect to technology, you really have to work with the instructional staff to understand what the technology uh, is and how it's addressing the barriers that you just mentioned. And one example might be uh, when we implemented Chromebooks across our uh, 1 through 8 grades. That, that really was a pretty clear decision, but when we started to look at what we might do in different places, we, when we found uh, individuals who might need a little bit more, we understood that it wasn't just, it wasn't going to be a one, one size fits all, so that we, we do adjust that. Uh, for example, perhaps a larger screen, uh, perhaps a touch, uh, a touch screen, all of which are stay within an envelope uh, of doing that. And I think, again, it, it comes back to how do those, as Pete said, how do those various devices or the software um, help you in addressing the multiple or the principles of universal design? Always come back to multiple means of presentation, of representation, of action and expression and engagement. If I could take a moment, here's an example of how this technology actually can support universal design. Uh, we had a student in one of our schools who um, was a self-selected mute. In other words, she chose not to speak because she did not like and felt embarrassed by the sound of her voice. We worked with her through um, its learning and our learning management product to be able to uh, 
to, to work first with classmates, one classmate, uh, who would receive her recorded responses, listen to them, and comment back. And eventually, this child became confident enough to be able to speak um, and coach other students in how to use videos for recording. So we see a way for this student uh, to overcome a barrier, but this certainly could be the same barrier that others, uh, many of our other students have. So again, as we look at the technology, it's not an end in itself, but really a way to get through those barriers and uh, address the needs of all of the students. I think that this is important. Um, that's a great example, Mike, um, and that demonstrates uh, what, we're, what we're talking about. We're kind of talking about this in kind of more general terms here, um, but one of the things, getting back to um, ESSA, is it asks that um, we need to demonstrate in our application that the system is going to be accessible to all students, and so uh, things like that that are great examples, I think, are, are great ways to also provide examples to other teachers. Um, this is such an important thing to professional development across the, the across all of the ranks of teachers. And um, examples like that are really great ways of showing how a student can be positively impacted by the decisions we make as educators and the resources that we provide. Okay. Um, thank you both for sharing um, those stories and examples and insights into how um, UDL um, is being used in your districts, how you are engaging students, serving them, and um, really removing barriers. Um, so thank you. We have, um, as I mentioned before, um, gathered quite a few questions from our audience. So. Um, I'd like to now um, turn to the Q&A um, portion of our discussion so that we can try to respond to our audience questions. So um, the first one we have here, um, Jenny Williams is asking, um, how does formative assessment support the UDL ideology? So I, I, I'll get started and then we'll let Mike uh, chime in. So I think um, they, the, the formative assessments, um, and I know everybody kind of does this a little bit differently, but um, they can really help to point out where a student might have some specific weaknesses. And I think that when uh, taken into um, consideration with um, UDL principles, I think it really helps us to perhaps identify those students that might need a little bit of assist additional assistance and um, I think that um, in some cases, um, again, kind of lowering the barriers as we've, as we've talked about can help those students out and um, uh, hopefully that's a, a, a reasonable answer. I don't know if you'd, what, what you'd care to add to that, Mike. I think, I think it's important because um, they do help you understand uh, whether or not, as you mentioned, Pete, you're reducing the barriers because there are, uh, you can use the data not just for one student. It, it can certainly help you with that one student, but also as you look at formative assessments, they can give you uh, an indication and a measure of how you're looking across uh, the class and as a result, fine tune or adjust or identify yet other barriers that you can remove. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is coming from Myron, and he's asking, are any of your schools utilizing video conferencing tools to allow instructors and or students to attend real-time courses remotely? Um. Yeah, you know, we, we use multiple modalities here. Um, we actually have um, a lot of blended learning that's happening, and as part of that, um, we use uh, its learning as well, uh, you know, our, our learning management system, as well as tools like Google Hangouts and um, Adobe Connect, and those um, 
typically have been used for staff to staff interactions, but we're seeing them increasingly used um, by students or in delivery to students. Uh, so we have, as one example, uh, we have someone that is the science teacher, if you will, for all of our elementary schools. He really is uh, the, a person that helps all our elementary students um, kind of um, learn different scientific principles. He works with all of our elementary teachers and um, we do multicasts and then we do follow-up uh, Q&A times and things like that with him um, and sometimes he'll actually show up in the class and sometimes we'll use a tool uh, like Adobe Connect that's become kind of one of his more favorite uh, tools. We haven't used that yet in student to student um, but that's something that's certainly worth looking into. Um, obviously, most of the student-to-student -student things are happening in chats and inside of collaborative documents. We've been using the uh, a number of different ways. We use its learning uh, as a way to present material, uh, recorded material, to students. Uh, some and other who we've had cases where students have left had to leave the state for medical uh, treatments uh, and we've uh, used, that's been one way that we have connected uh, with them. Uh, we've also, uh, we will be doing later this uh, summer, we'll be implementing uh, online courses uh, as we uh, look at how we can provide uh, some summer school and some availability to materials that we might not otherwise be available or uh, be able to present to our students. Uh, for budgetary reasons. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is coming from Caroline, and she is asking how has its learning specifically helped your districts implement UDL? You're the expert on this, Mike. I'm going to let you run with it. <laughs> well, We're just getting started with its learning. Um, yeah, we we had. Uh, it's learning in place since the uh, fall of uh, 2015 uh, across the district. And uh, by the way, the number, uh, the current number is about 95% of our students and faculty will touch its learning in any given week. Uh, it's helped us, uh, I mentioned earlier the example of a biology uh, class where its learning can be used for uh, is used to provide uh, access to video, to audio, or to textbook materials for a specific lecture. Um, we've used its learning uh, as preparation for snow day treatment, uh, snow day um, response, uh, and e-learning days. Uh, I saw one where uh, students were given uh, being uh, given uh, physical education instruction. Uh, through universal design, or through its learning, all of which really come back to how do we use that tool in each, in each of these cases to help kids uh, access the material in a way that works for them. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, on the uh, action and expression or demonstration of mastery side, our students are using its learning uh, as the vehicle to present their materials, whether they're a video that they've produced uh, or a PowerPoint that they've produced, uh, it provides them with that platform for uh, capturing it and uh, presenting it to the teacher in class. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is actually a, a combination of two questions that are both related to uh, professional development. Um, coming from Patricia and Elaine, um, and I know that you um, touched on this before, but there's um, a question on how a UDL focus has changed professional development in your districts, um, and also um, how do you handle any pushback in terms of how time-consuming it can be to um, incorporate UDL? You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, we will often hear, I, I kind of laughed, chuckled a little bit because we often hear how time consuming it is. I mean, we all know, and myself as a, I, I think I'm still a teacher, but I'm not in the classroom anymore. Um, you know, we, uh, teachers devote so much time to their work. I think what we're trying to do is to provide a way, and I think learning management's helped to do this, is to provide a way to maximize the teacher's time. They don't have time to do anything else. 
So we have to take something away. And what I hope we can do is we get to more differentiation of instruction. And you know, we we're talking about formative assessments a little bit ago. As we try to identify specific student needs and try to treat all students um, equally, uh, there are ways we can do this. And, and I mentioned blended learning earlier. I think this is one of the solutions um, that we can put in place: is um, providing teachers with a little bit more maybe we call it free time, um, to be able to move to those students that need a little bit of additional assistance and um, other students can be working on other projects. I think the biggest barrier we have is that um, many times our schools are structured in such a way that we make teachers and students rigidly march to the bell schedule, uh, rigidly march to um, you know the traditional um, kind of industrial area era uh, <laughs> even pedagogies, and, and we need to break that a little bit. And, and my hope is that um, because there is an innovative component of ESSA, that maybe schools will be motivated uh, to do things that are a little bit more um, maybe non-traditional, <laughs> uh, a little bit more appropriate to provide the needs, provide for the needs of all our students. So, when you ask how uh, UDL has changed the professional development. Uh, UDL really has become part of the way that we view professional development for our teachers as well as our students, uh, well, for all of our staff, uh, because the same principles apply to adult learners as apply to uh, our students. But it, it's also, as Pete said, uh, in some ways it can drain the, drain the uh, bath that's currently overflowing because you're now looking at the barriers that affect all of the students, uh, and knocking that barrier down for one student may well reach a student that you hadn't uh, anticipated as having that same yes. barrier. Exactly. And I, I think I, I didn't really hit on the UDL piece of it. I think it's, it's, again, asking that question consistently. And this is where it needs to be a decision. Um, you know, I know a lot of folks on this line are probably not superintendents or members of a superintendent's cabinet, but it really needs to be a decision um, if UDL is really going to impact your district um, that is coming uh, across the board. Teachers know that it's important. Administrators know it's important. Superintendent Tenant's cabinet knows it's important, and the school board knows it's important. And because they do, um, they will incorporate this into uh, each area so that it is, in fact, ubiquitous. And when it is, then it becomes a part of all the professional development because you're constantly asking these types of questions to make sure that we're leveling the playing field. It's, and it's not, at the, it's not at the detriment of those students that might not need um, some of the benefits of universal design. I, I think they can succeed just as well uh, and flourish. It's about allowing all students to flourish because we've leveled the playing field. Okay, great. Um, the next question for you two is coming from Randall. And he's asking, what role do you see for digital content and online instructional resources in supporting and implementing UDL? Well, that's, that's been a very important piece for us. Uh, as we've looked at our last uh, two adoptions, uh, we've actually moved away from uh, print materials in a large degree because we find that the uh, digital materials really address the bigger need. And we can always we can always print something if we need it for a student. If there's if there's a reason that student uh, or to eliminate that particular barrier. Uh, but we find that with the content, uh, with digital content, with open uh, education resources, we look at how do we how do we use all those with our students. Um, and it, UDL becomes actually a part of how we evaluate uh, the, the curriculum of the, the materials that we're going to adopt. Are they consistent with universal design in terms of, uh, again, being available in multiple formats in multiple ways uh, for those students? You know, for the last four or five years, we've been very involved here in Indiana with an initiative to allow teachers to create digital content. And um, I'm, I'm a fan of buying it, but I'm also a fan of allowing teachers to customize and to uh, 
issue out their own in a collaborative way with their peers. Uh, no teacher can do this on their own. They're too busy. But um, if we can um, use a learning management system to be able to share a product, and uh, that I think that helps a lot. I, I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. We have 155 fully online classes that, that we're um, actually still kind of working to convert. Um, and as we've made this transition, it's learning. And yet I do think that um, it is not for everyone it, because uh, UDL principles apply here. And so, you know, some people say, well, we shouldn't print anything anymore. I, I really disagree with that. As a matter of fact, we might need to be able to print things really big. Um, and we just, again, need to kind of break the mold of, of having to use the book, per se. Um, and yet we also need to be able to differentiate the materials that we're providing to the students um, based on their specific needs. So I, I think, again, we're trying to give um, some um, agency to the teacher to be able to provide those needs. And I think one of those um, resources is certainly online resources. Okay, great. Um, the next question is coming from Elaine. Um, and I know there was a reference earlier to um, PE classes, but she's asking, um, how can universal design for learning be uh, implemented and used in the non-academic classes like PE, art, and band? I have a good answer for this. Um, so one of our online classes that we offer, it's a fully online class. Um, and you might think, PE, a fully online class? How does that work? Um, well, it's not the PE we think of. Uh, we think of maybe the PE we had when we were children. Um, and uh, it really is, that's a, one of the best examples, actually, of being able to be very um, adaptive to the needs of the student. So in our online PD class, I'm sorry, in our online um, class for, uh, this is for high school and uh, we've got some for junior high school students. Um, the student can identify their own activity um, and with the help of the teacher, the teacher can help and prompt them of course, I mean some of their one-on-ones, um, but the student can define the type of activity that would meet the requirement for the class and then they would use, they would go through that activity and then be able to report in on their progress and then, you know, uh, we, 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 we can even use uh, fitness bands and things like that to be able to measure activity um, and so I think that um, online courses do provide uh, especially non-academic um, option, uh, options for classes, um, some real flexibility that will allow for us to customize um, not, not only the exercise or the, the activity for the, for the student that has um, a physical need, but even to customize to what students like to do so that they can be, I, I'm going to use that word engagement, so they can use, be more engaged with the things they really like, um, which might have higher interest levels to them, which might allow them to participate more fully. And so, um, again, I think that the, the, the idea of UDL um, needs to be applied to all students because um, it can help them to um, really celebrate the things they love and uh, really allow them to be more successful um, in their participation as opposed to trying to define it in some way, again, by the kind of an industrial model of having it all be exactly the same. I think uh, to pick up where Pete left off, uh, in, for example, he, he mentioned in, in the ways, the things that uh, really appeal to them to engage them. Uh, as you look at music, you might look at different um, types of music, different areas of music the student uh, wants to become engaged in. Uh, but then from the standpoint of representation, uh, whether you play that, whether uh, you listen to it, you watch it. Uh, the presentation, uh, again, our, our ways of approaching that, of structuring it, of, of finding um, how to make that student bring that, the, the expert learner in that student out. And that can include um, how the student brings uh, background knowledge uh, to that instruction. Because universal design is not just simply those three principles. Those principles go much, much deeper uh, into guidelines and ways of uh, developing materials and uh, conducting instruction. Uh, so it's not um, a simple 
uh, in music, uh, you're going to have them do a, a PowerPoint instead of, although that could be a part, uh, that could be a way of demonstrating some portion of that mastery. Uh, not all of the pieces are going to fit in exactly the same ways. I think the beauty of this is that with stu for students with the most significant cognitive or physical disabilities, um, we can provide alternative options for them, and that's really what this is all about. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, we have another question coming in from Alice, and she's asking from a planning perspective, what are the best ways for district technology leaders to align with curriculum and instruction in implementing UDL? What are the best ways for us to align with curriculum instruction? Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, right. Okay. So, um, to me, I think that uh, this uh, this hopefully is an encouragement to for the IT folks to engage with the curriculum folks. Um, this is essential, and in order for our school districts to be successful and, quite frankly, maybe even survive. Um, we really need to work closely with them. Uh, this is a, a bit of a new era that we've been in over the last couple of years, and it will continue to grow. There needs to be really close um, articulation between um, what curriculum is trying to do um, instructionally and, and as well as this, from an assessment perspective and what we do as IT folks. Um, and uh, that's at least my the, the, the hat I wear. And so uh, what we need to do, I think, is, is to just be able to work closely with them. We need to approach them. And I, I'm really glad to say that we have a great relationship with uh, our CIA, our curriculum instruction and assessment folks. Um, and our e-learning team, and our IT services team, and our data services team. Those three teams work very closely to provide for uh, those departments, and um, you know there's a real back and forth. And I think that's what you're trying to create in your organization is to create a real good, um, you know, a set of language because uh, curricular language is not the same as IT language. Um, and once you have that language established, is to have those regular opportunities to interact um, on, especially on new initiatives. I, th I think also the opportunity, to, as Pete said, to constantly communicate, uh, to be uh, a part of the conversation. Uh, the fact that you have two technology people here talking about uh, what is essentially an instructional uh, concept is uh, an example of how technology and instruction really have to come together to speak, as Pete said, the same language, to understand that technology, and technology, one of the conversation, uh, comments that we use in, in common sayings is we can't let our technology be a barrier to the instruction. Uh, and so we focus on issues of uh, how do you prevent failure, for example, in the classroom or uh, in the infrastructure, which immediately becomes a barrier to that, technolo uh, that, that technology to being part of the instruction. We even avoid the use of technology if we can do that in, in technological terms. We don't call uh, its learning our learning management system. We call it our um, learning hub, you know, so it's focused on learning. Okay, great. Um, I think that's all we have time for in terms of questions for today, unfortunately, but please feel free to continue the conversation on Twitter and we will attempt to uh, reach everyone offline. Um, I would like to take a minute to thank Mike and Pete both for lending their experiences and their expertise to today's topic and for providing us with a very valuable discussion. Um, thank you to our audience members for listening and for your participation during today's webinar. There will be a few follow-up questions for you at the end, and we will be sending you a link to the recording, as well as further information on UDL. For more information on It's Learning, please visit www.itslearning.net, and have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.